to our second live session for Open Branding Month. Thank you for being here. I see there are some people that are here that were also here yesterday, so that's great. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Um, as you guys, as you guys know, uh, you know we are trying to do something that is a little bit more of a daily dose of branding, shall we say, rather than taking what was an extraordinary event, thanks to folks like Laura, that was uh, <laughs> that was offline into the online space. And so actually today we do have Laura with us. Uh, some of you might have seen her here in Romania last year. Some of you might know her from her books, of course. She's the president and co-founder with her extraordinary father, <laughs> of course, Al Reese of, of Reese and Reese. So welcome, Laura. Thank you for joining us, of course. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. It's so great to, to connect with you again after that fantastic trip to Romania and the uh, really superb event that y'all put on. Oh, thanks. Thanks. And I think we need to all just take a minute to admire her, her setup at home because it's, because it's just. <laughs> well, wish. when you're, when you're in branding and uh, your specialty is about focus and visuals and visual hammers, you need to look the part. And so I'm doing <laughs> my best to look the part of branding guru. Every, every little thing counts. <laughs> I think that's that is, it, so where it, we're going to start. And that's probably where we're going to end up most likely knowing us. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so for everybody that's listening, so I have obviously I have uh, quite a few questions that I want to ask Laura based on not only on her presentation that some of you might have seen yesterday on on rebelsrulers.com, but I also encourage you all to please send in your questions using the Q&A function if you're on Zoom or the chat if you're on Facebook. I will try to filter in as many as I can throughout the conversation based on how it's flowing and things like that. I tend to get to almost all of them. So if you have any questions along the way, definitely let me know. Um, but other than that, I think we're going to get started. So speaking of what you were just saying, I'd love to hear from you, which is probably one of the most, I think, difficult questions to encompass in one response. But given that branding is still a relatively undefined term, I think it's getting better. And to ironically, maybe even this past year has helped to really define some of those some of those uh, rougher edges, but how would you describe the role of the brand in an organization? Well, the role of a brand in an organization, I mean, it really has enormous value to the organization. And the value is, is that it owns a space in the mind, in the mind of the consumers out there. Um, not that it's just known, but it's known for something. And that's where the true value come in, comes in. I mean, it's great to, you know, have it recognized, but have it connected to an idea um, an idea that's memorable, powerful, and motivating. Uh, so if I want to work out at home these days, what do I think? I think Peloton, that workout bike, that interactive workout bike with live and streaming and on-demand type workouts with those instructors. Um, they own that space, they own that idea, and they dominate that category. Um, while brands are great, um, it is the categories that they're connected to that really drive the value. Because if your category is important and your brand dominates the category, that's where the magic happens. Hmm. And so this, this, seems, uh, this seems relatively similar to maybe how some folks would talk about purpose as well. Would you, how would you consider those the same or different or being that purpose is such an I would say overly used phrase at the moment. It, it can be. Um, and many of these terms are sort of or overly used, but purpose is more in usually it's more internal to the organization in terms of it. It is driving the the, the motivation and the morale of your employees. It, it has to do with values in, in many cases and is, mm -hmm. is absolutely a good thing. Now in a in a few cases that that is connected to the brand externally. So you have a brand like Tom Shoes, for example, that they really drive the purpose of helping the world and donating shoes to people as is an integral in terms of the brand. There's very yeah. few that make that connection in that way. And uh, some that try to do it in an inauthentic way. And that, 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 that turns off consumers when they try to slap some purpose on at the, <laughs> at the last yeah. hour, so to speak, without it, it really being authentic to their brand. So while every comment company has a, you know, a purpose and should do good in the world um, that is separate, I think, from the idea of a brand and every company should have a brand that owns something. Hmm. Okay. So then what would you say in, in, let's say the, in the last few years, for example, I don't want to focus just on this year, because I think this is, might be a, 
a, a, a wider space that I'm looking at. Hopefully, but hopefully this year is an anomaly. I just don't, I'm, I'm hoping it does not repeat. I'm itself. hoping whatever the trends were before this, maybe, you know, some years. of them I'd like for them to continue to be honest yeah, after sure. this, after this, but how has brand management then changed in recent years? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And I think uh, we all have realized in recent years, our entire world has changed, has become more digital. Um, in terms of brand management, there's a lot of digital tools <laughs> and techniques that you can use to um, look at how your brand is acting, how people are interacting with your brand, what they're saying about your brand on the social media channels and words and visuals that are connected with it. Um, so I think there's a lot more tools uh, you can use within the brand management space. Now, the idea of a brand is still the same in terms of owning an idea in the consumer's mind, but the consumers are, are talking about them and they're using, obviously, the internet has become incredibly important, but the idea of a brand owning an idea, like Starbucks and expensive coffee is the same, but how you look at it and analyze it has become, obviously, much more digital in this world. Hmm. And do you feel like clients are still judging by your experience? I'm, I mean, <laughs> extraordinary amount of experience, but do you, do you feel like clients are still grappling with this or are they relatively set in the idea, but it's simply moving maybe a little bit too fast? And once they get settled in, it's already a different context or once they, you know, I keep feeling like it's this constant shuffle, so to speak. And I'm wondering how you how you talk to your clients about this in relation to obviously having this very, I would say, very stable position. Yeah. It, it really depends. That, again, we mentioned the idea of category. Category is really an incredible um, and important element here. And what category you're in really depends how those conversations flow. So if you have a really fast moving category, like you know, cell phones and technology, many of these things are moving at a rapid pace. We're having the introduction of, of new categories and new brands all the time mm -hmm. uh, versus you know, very old categories, you know, like pancake mix and, and flour and spices, right? These things have had a new life because of we're all baking and cooking at home mm -hmm. more, but those categories and those brands haven't changed that much. <laughs> and, and sometimes, sometimes they need to change. Some have looked at themselves and said, you know, we have a pancake mix called Aunt Jemima that has uh, imagery that yeah. really looks now very outdated. And they're making the change and have decided to go ahead and, and change that brand name uh, because it, it just doesn't fit with today's modern look at, at how we look at, at race and people and, and use those types of terms. So, um, however, I mean, that brand was still, you know, <laughs> the leader in the category, right? Um, so those types of categories don't change very often and others are changing all the time. And then you have to look at, you know, how well your brand is known. Um, when you have a well-established no known brand, it is very difficult to make changes because you have cemented, if you will, in the mind. It's hard to change a mind when, once it's already been made up. Yeah. Um, if, if your brand isn't well known, well, then, of course, you have a lot more flexibility in, in what you can do and what you can talk about. Is it difficult for you to ex to explain this this let's say this focus on a category to clients? Are they are they taking other things about their business into consideration when trying to uh, build up that competitive framework? Let's say rather than staying very very centered on on the category as you're as you're saying. Entrepreneurs, we, we work with all types of companies, and so we have you know you have big companies that really have well established. Um, ways of handling brands and thinking about categories. They kind of overanalyze it sometimes too much. Yeah. Um, and then entrepreneurs that we also work a lot with, and, and they are really driven by and excited by categories. That's probably why they launched the brand they did. Uh, so it is rather intuitive. The, the difficulty is, is, and what's really important is talking to people. And what's often is, you know, we get into a case where, you know, how you define the category, how you speak about it, um, and then how that brand connects to it and what that brand name is, is incredibly important. And so often you, you find that you talk to them and said, yes, we've had trouble for years trying to explain what we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, simplifying it is, uh, you know, incredibly important. It's kind of like saying, well, it was a, it was a touchscreen phone, right? One of these, they called it a smartphone. That was an excellent category name. And of course, it was the iPhone that, that pioneered that and um, is, is do, doing really well, although Android has, has come out above and has 75% market share worldwide um, coming later into the category. But the, the category and the category name and how you define that are, are really essential and part of the branding process. 
Okay, so if I'm thinking about from a from a positioning standpoint then and trying to maybe hone in just for a second on what happened this year because what we were talking about before you and I really I'd really like to I'd really like to mention that here. Um, what did you maybe notice most this year from brands, especially bigger brands that maybe we can all learn from? I mean, I think I think uh, I think your your take on 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 focus and how it defines brand strength is is something that we should really we should really delve into a bit. <laughs> Absolutely. And we, we talked and it's, it's so incredibly important and the underlining principle, you know, we've written my dad, uh, either him or with myself, 12 books, right? Um, on From focus to positioning to the immutable laws of branding and marketing and visual hammer and battle cry. What's the underlying principle? The one thing that holds all these things together and is the critical element in being successful at any of them from mm -hmm. you know, using PR to all of it. And the word is focus, uh, that you need to have a focus to find a position. You need to have a focus to select your visual hammer. And that's the critical element. It's the one thing that's also really difficult for companies to do. They hate to do it. <laughs> Their natural inc inclination is want to grow and to grow by expansion, by you know getting into other things. Um, and so what I think has happened with the pandemic and, and many like other you know, recession type of things is that companies hunker down and, and they reevaluate mm -hmm. and they get back to their core. You hear that, get back to your roots. What does that really mean? It usually means they get back to the focus, the thing that they really stand for, the thing that drives them, the thing that they own, right? And they, they re redouble down, if you will, on that. And that's a great thing. That has been incredibly helpful to brands to not forget where they came from, not to forget what they own in the mind and do their best to reinforce it and maybe expand it even more. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, McDonald's is, you know, thinking more about burgers and, and ways to improve drive through drive through is the core of their business. Yet they spend a lot of time, you know, getting into pizzas and other things um, and uh, doing things that they shouldn't have been doing, fo thinking too much about breakfast and fancy coffee. When improving drive through simplifying their menu has done them a great bit of good. The other example is Coca-Cola has looked and reevaluated. Maybe we have too many brands, you think? <laughs> uh, many of those brands, and they've decided to cut 200, 200 brands. They realize yeah, so that actually lot. that's a lot. Um, and some of them are well-known, like Zinco um, Coconut Water, Ottawa Juice Drinks, Life Coca-Cola, which was a ridiculous line extension um, that they kept around way too long. They're cutting tab, finally letting that brand go. And they haven't announced the rest, but many of them others. What they looked at the numbers and in many companies, you look at this and it's the same way. Half of their brands accounted for 2% of them sales. Mm -hmm. Brands who quite often you see, you know, look and focus on your big, big successes and reinforce those. Think more about driving Coke and Sprite and their big brands and let go of the smaller brands, particularly for a big company like a Coca-Cola. Tragically, also companies like Coke, you know, they're letting go of the loser brands, the Me Too brands. Um, so of course they saw Vita, Vita Coca, Coconut Water being super successful. So they had a Me Too Zinca brand, Zinco yeah. brand. You know, all those Me Too brands, you know, Mr. Pibb and many others that Coke has launched over the years were never successful because they weren't pioneering. They didn't, you know, lead and create new categories with the brands. They were just copycat imitators. And those don't tend to, to work well um, overall. So, you know, if it takes us time to, to look and, and reevaluate, are you doing some things that don't make sense? Um, that you can cut out so you can refocus on what's really important, what your brand is really the best at and do more of that. Hmm. Now you make a really good point. And I think that this relates heavily to the concept of a lifestyle brand and whatever that means. Um, maybe, maybe you can touch on that because I know that you have, <laughs> you have a strong opinion about, about the concept of a lifestyle brand, but uh, I you, think I'd you love always... for people to hear it. Yeah, you always got to be wary when when a new brand that's having some success says we want to elevate ourselves. Being a, a Peloton bike isn't enough for us anymore. We want to be an, a lifestyle, a lifestyle brand. <laughs> I'm thinking, are you crazy? No, you're, you're a bike brand. Um, you know, a wonderful interactive fitness company that is, you know, doing tremendously well because you own something stand for something it's it's not a i mean yes i mean it is part of many people's everyday lives but you know they've got three only three million 
customers. I mean, now they want to compete. And, and what was in you know the Wall Street Journal recently talking about their plans is we want to compete with Nike and Under Armour mm. <laughs> to be an all apparel brand. Are you kidding me? <laughs> You've only got 3 million customers subscribing to your fitness service. Don't you think there's more opportunity to expand that market instead of competing with Nike and Under Armour in all clothing? Uh, it's not, it all, other people's businesses always look, you know, the grass is always greener. Oh, it looks easy to jump into uh, athletic wear. Um, it, it's not that easy. I hate to tell you. And, and let's not forget that business, you know, they're selling lots of t-shirts because Peloton today is a hot brand. Sure. Um, but, you know, folk keeping it a hot brand and getting more than just 3 million subscribers should be, you know, the everyday focus of, of a company of that size, instead of saying, we're going to take on Nike. And, 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 and do you believe that even if you had that ambition to take on Nike, which nobody's saying it's a bad thing necessarily, if you really are the next Nike, but maybe it's a matter of when you say it, how you say it. I think there are a little, a it's few a, more yeah, factors there. It's a, it's a little early and they're, they're coming <laughs> off just a very hot PR opportunity here with the pandemic and people just suddenly switching to life at home and, and experiencing these things and they can't go to the gym and, you know, it's become a wonderful alternative, but that kind of PR won't last forever. And uh, the, the hotness of any brand doesn't last forever. Um, although I think they have a powerful brand. I, I want them to stay focused. Some people might be buying just the shirts, to be honest, you know, <laughs> they might be buying just yeah, the it's, shirts. But it, it's possible. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the kink and that's the rub, right? Is it, it the opportunity is to, of course, get your dedicated customers to buy the apparel. And I think they are, and I think they'll buy more, but your resources, when you are a company, um, you know, your resources of, of time and people are incredibly important and how you divvy them up and how you focus or unfocus them um, is really important. And, and making sure you don't get sidetracked by things that aren't really part of your core business. Now Peloton has expanded and they've launched a treadmill and done some other exercise things. And sure, I mean, I, I think you can you know, understand some of that, but the departure into thinking we're gonna become an apparel brand, I think mm. is one step a little bit too far. Um, but it, it becomes the, the nature of people. They do want to do that, but you've got to rein yourself in. We also talk in terms of, you know, it's like pruning a tree um, and good, a good focus, a, a good company is always kind of looking at and keeping that tree pruned. It's possible to grow out and spread your wings, but you also have to make sure you do stay tight. You do remain owning something in the mind and not undermining that by doing too much. This is really what I was going to ask if you believe this focus to be sustainable and and how, to be honest, because I think translating this mentality from, you know, a, a business leader that you sit and convince <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in a meeting or a workshop or something, translating that focus sustainably to an entire organization is is a whole nother is a whole nother feat. Well, it's a, it's a challenge. I think it can become actually boring within a company, right? If you're a BMW and say, oh my gosh, if I talk about the ultimate driving machine one more time, I mean, how boring. <laughs> For you, it might be boring, but it's the idea <laughs> that you own in the mind and the continually touching and hitting it into the consumer's mind is, is what's propelling and maintaining your business. So in, in some ways, a, a focus can be a little bit boring within a company over decades. And, and that's what a really good brand does is maintain that focus over decades. But we also talk about, and this is a really good analogy to help, it's you can't just set a focus and then have it be good forever. It is something that has to be maintained. And, and here's the example. Um, every you know, once or twice a year, right? You call it spring cleaning or, or fall. We've we've looked at our closet and said, we're gonna I'm gonna clean up my closet, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna get all these. I'm gonna get rid of the shirts that don't fit, that are not fashionable, or the pants, or and I'm gonna organize it by color, and it's all gonna be beautiful. And that's a little bit like um, a focus. And when you look at a company, we work with a company, we kind of clean it up, we organize it, we get rid of the things that aren't working, and, and rededicate, right, to keeping it neat and orderly. Yeah. Um, and that's great. But over what happens six months later, it's a mess again. <laughs> Who can keep their closet perfectly organized? Nobody, at least nobody I know, and certainly not me. So, um, you know, companies do have to rededicate themselves every couple of years to sort of go ahead and, and clean up because it is a, a natural occurrence to, to become slightly unfocused. But if you keep it, uh, keep it tight and keep it organized, 
One other point I want to make, um, it, it's really important as brands are launching to maintain a focus. What gets uh, people in trouble is when they look at established companies and they say, well, Amazon has gotten into everything. Why? Oh, I want to be Amazon. Well, are you Amazon today? <laughs> Do you dominate a category? And think about as a brand, it, it takes off. It's like an airplane. You're rattling down the runway. You got uh, you got to use 110 percent of power before you can get in the air. Mm. It's a little bit like a brand. A brand like Amazon's at 30,000 feet. They can make they can make moves. You can't if you're just trying to get off the runway. And remember, if you look back in history at most of these types of brands like Amazon, were extremely focused to get off the ground. Extremely focused. They focused on books and not mm. just books. Best selling books at 30 percent off. That was the key driver to get the brand off the ground. And then they were able to expand. So make sure your brand's off the ground before you try to do any crazy type unfocusing moves. Now you make a good point. I'm wondering if I'm wondering if focus is 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 maybe the the one thing you would identify for becoming a leader in a category to to, to dominate that leadership position, or are there other are there other things around that that are you know closely tied tied to reaching that spot? Well, the the key to becoming a leader in the category is usually by pioneering the category, meaning that you're first in the category, not just in the market but in the mind. Uh, we're on a technology today called Zoom. <laughs> and there were a lot of technologies out there as a matter of fact, but Zoom was entirely focused on making this video experience um, super simple, super easy. And they focus just on video, not some of the other ancillary things. And of course, with, with a good name and a tight focus and Zoom, you know, while there were others out there, Zoom got in the mind, Zoom dominates the category. And so that is the, the critical thing of, of being first um, has a lot to do with it, especially if you co combine it with that great focus and good name. That's where your huge advantage is. Hmm. I'm trying to establish. Well, let me make one more point on that because yeah. it's a really, a, really a clear thing because you might have a company that says, well, our, our category is established. I can't be first anymore. All right. Well, that's fine. So, you know, when you, there is an established category, like you could say Red Bull and energy drink, right? Mm -hmm. They created the category and they dominate the category on a worldwide basis. My goodness, how are you going to compete? Well, hundreds of companies have come on to compete. I mean, that's normal. Um, but most of them have copied Red Bull. They've copied the small can. They use energy type names and none have really been very successful except one. The one brand that did the best against Red Bull took the opposite approach. So when you're going against the leader, the best thing is not to emulate them, not to mm -hmm. copy them and try to be better. The best is to be the opposite. And that brand is Monster. Yeah. And Monster, instead of a small can, did a monster size 16 ounce can. Now, is 16 ounces better? I don't know. Many, maybe it's not. Maybe it's <laughs> for your more. health, most certainly not. But <laughs> more calories. I don't know. But um, it is different, and that yeah. um, difference is what's the key driver in building the brand. And today, Monster is a very strong competitor to Red Bull, not just in the U.S. but now growing around the world. Um, again, combining with that difference, with a name, with a visual, all of those things coming together so that they can compete in an existing category by being different, not by being better. Yeah, here for sure. I mean, here I can see it even with young, younger, younger kids, maybe, I don't know, 14, 15. They don't say they want a Red Bull. They ask you if you can get them a monster. It's And, and monster also tends to be a little bit more active in the younger space, I would say, and not necessarily something I agree with uh, when it comes to energy drinks, but they're definitely a little bit more present. While I think Red Bull was uh, seems to be doing some of the more extreme things that maybe maybe my generation or older would look at and say, you know, like the stratosphere, which to be honest, I watched it and I couldn't believe that that guy just, it was jumped. an incredible moment. He didn't, he didn't just, he didn't jump. He just, he just stepped as if I was stepping out of my house, to be honest, it was, I thought it was incredible, but I it mean, was a big event. it was a long time ago though, right? It was, it was a while ago remember. for sure. But I think that these are the, you know, there, there are some subtle differences that maybe, maybe add or don't add to the longevity. This is something that, uh, that's why I was asking, you know, like what are, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is what are the metrics that you can look for to say, okay, well, I've, you know, I, I want to gauge my my leadership position is it sustainable is it is it holding on is it and and what are what are some of the metrics that maybe you 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 suggest clients clients look for 
Well, of course, market market share is incredibly important and, and top of mind awareness to understand how those are changing or how those are affected over time, not just for you, but also for your competitor. What you're really is analyzing that mind space and positioning of you as well as your competition in the mind. And of course, what you mentioned is an example um, across many categories. There's always an opportunity for the choice of a new generation. There's nothing more that the kids like to do than do the opposite of what their parents did. And so while your parents maybe drank Red Bull, I grew up, you know, Red Bull was a big deal. You know, my kids don't want anything to do with what I think is cool. They want to do the opposite. So actually over time, any categories has that bit of an opportunity to be the choice of a new generation and to launch themselves, position themselves. And as Monster done, they, they've picked activities and sporting events that do appeal more to the younger, um, you know, fringe type things that the, the, mm -hmm. the kids are into now. And so, and they are, of course, as a newer brand, have the opportunity to be that choice of a new generation. Now, of course, Red Bull still dominates because there's always the power of being the leader, of being the original, of being the real thing in the category. But over time, no brand is, you know, safe forever. Um, there are times when, you know, brands just become totally out of favor. It depends on the category, though, how long that will be, how long that will last. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, many, you can think of many other beverage brands like Don Perignon Champagne, for example, you know, been around many, many, you know, over decades or decades, centuries, right? Yeah. So many things, you know, that classic um, can remain forever. But the good news is there's always opportunities for newer brands to come in either by slightly creating a new category, you, say in energy drinks, there was other brands that came in and took a new category approach, like three hour energy, right? That was in a very mm -hmm. tiny little shot bottle. So instead of drinking all those cal calories and, and drinks, you can have that. So there's other opportunities to go ahead and you re slightly even redefine the category so that you can create a new brand of your own. Yeah, I, ironically, I don't drink energy drinks, but I can, I know that I think the first one they made was five hour energy. And I remember that bottle clearly always at the <laughs> counter, you know, at the counter at the store. I know exactly yeah. what it looks like. Never yeah, touched the stuff. That wrong. Is it five hours? But I know exactly. I'm sure that I'm sure they came up with a three hour one after that because they realized <laughs> that in five hours, I don't a know, lot maybe of some people only wanted a little bit, you know, before, <laughs> before going to bed, they were worried they wouldn't be able to sleep. But no, you make a, I mean, you make a really good point. And, and I think, I think this idea of heritage is, 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 is radically important because I'm, I'm wondering if the strength of a brand is directly related to time, you know, what factor negative or positive does heritage play, especially when brands are in crisis, which is something that we've, we've seen a lot of recently. That, that, that's a terrific uh, point. And I think heritage and what that connects to is authenticity. Do you have a, a true heritage that really relates to something very true and authentic? And when you talk about what do you know millennials want, and really it's true for all customers, they do crave that. They don't want something fake and made up and you know figured out in a in a in a lab, if you will. They they want something real, and it also connects to and what we see today is the importance of that people play within the company and within a brand. I mean, today you know the CEO is incredibly important no matter what the company is. Uh, they're on TV all the time. They have to be the spokesperson for the company or the brand. And why you have, you know, rock star inventors and entrepreneurs, uh, you know, like Elon Musk at Tesla or, yeah. you know, James Dyson at, at Dyson. And so they are, you know, rock stars, if you will. Um, and, you know, you never saw that um, years ago where these CEOs have become rock stars in terms of our everyday life where ordinary consumers know them. And that's where, you know, it's incredibly important why? Because PR is so incredibly important for a brand. I mean, think where would where would Starbucks be without Howard Schultz? I mean, him talking about the category, his brand Starbucks or Bill Gates. I mean, this is not a new thing, um, but it is, you know, across the board for all brands, incredibly important that these CEOs, founders um, are speaking to the company. It is, of course, 
over time, um, when those people are no longer with the company, it, it's more difficult and challenging. For example, uh, you know, KFC had Colonel Sanders in the beginning, yeah. you know, of course he was alive and incredibly important. Today, you know, we remember him and we use his imagery on everything, but it is a disadvantage, right? That he's not here anymore. But of course he's, he's well-known and well-remembered by the brand. True, true. And you were, uh, you were, you were mentioning also when we were when we were talking the the role of diversification. You know, yes, we have we have a very strong focus, but then where does that leave diversification? Because it's not like it's never a good choice or it's never the right option. Um, but I think you have quite a different, uh, quite a clear approach to how you think about diversification within the context of focus, which is maybe something that you can touch upon. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's the first question that comes up for a company. Well, how we need to grow. How are we going to grow if we have to be focused? If this brand has to, you know, can only stand for one thing and in one category. Well, the answer is quite simple. The answer is multiple brands. What we saw in the 20th century was really um, the success of single brand companies. And you had <clears throat> examples, GE and IBM and the strategy of putting one name on everything, you know, what did work in, in many cases and was fine. Believe me, that's not the, the way to build value and success in a, a powerful company in the 21st century. The way to do it is with multiple brands. So you have companies like, you know, even Coca-Cola, it is the diversification of not the line extension of Coca-Cola, yeah. but having multiple brands, you know, like Sprite and others that has given the company power. <clears throat> and, and they realize they need to cut down and even not have so many so they can mm. really focus on those. Or you have examples like Procter and Gamble, right? They've got, you know, 20 brands that each do a, over a billion dollars in sale. So the opportunity is, is not to say, hey, you know, we're the, the Dell computer company. Everything we sell has to say Dell. No, yeah. the opportunity is to say, if we're going to go in a new category, maybe we need a new name. Uh, mm -hmm. For Apple, you know, one of the, one, depending on the day, you know, the most valuable company in the world, what did they do? They've got multiple brands that dominate multiple, you know, different categories. You've got iPhone and smartphones and you've got Macintosh and, and computers, right? Two names, two categories. And that's the way you need to think. Um, or Google, for example, one of its big successes, it doesn't say Google at all. It sends Android. Yeah, one of the mistakes, yeah. however, when companies do this is they always, they, they love their name so much is they always have to put the little brought to you by, forget that. Um, the benefit is to actually the disassociation. Um, one of the classic examples, of course, is Toyota wanted to launch an upscale car. They didn't call it the Toyota Supreme. They called it a Lexus. And they distanced themselves from Lexus, right? It was separate dealerships. I mean, people bought a Lexus despite the fact it was made by Toyota. You certainly yes, wouldn't want to remind I agree. consumers that you know, the consumer doesn't want to hear that. On the other hand, in the PR, the investor, of course, uh, when Toyota talks to the investment community, they say, yes, we are the Toyota company and we own multiple brands including Lexus, uh, the leading Japanese luxury vehicle, Prius, the leading hybrid vehicle, and that is the power. It derives not the fact that Toyota's name is on everything, but the fact that they own multiple brands under one company called Toyota. Now you make, you make a good point. And I was gonna ask, you know, what role does transparency then play? Because uh, like you said, do people need to know upfront that if I'm buying a Lexus, I'm buying from Toyota, do I mean do, do the brands differ so much in a house of brands that you can you know safely say oh no they don't need to know or they do need to know that this brand comes from this larger group or something like this? Well, when you when you say transparency, I, I certainly don't think that there's no intent on hiding the fact that Toyota is you know that Toyota owns the Lexus brand, but what the motivating factor for most companies is they think they're going to benefit by telling the Lexus owner that Toyota makes it or that you know they're talking to you know, any sort of line extension. I mean, why do you do a line extension? Why does it, they call it Bud Light Seltzer? Because they think Bud Light is such a powerful name. They want to put it on the seltzer <laughs> instead of thinking of it as a second, uh, thinking of a second brand name that doesn't say Bud Light at all. They think they're getting actually benefit from having that brand. Instead, the opposite is true to the consumer. Um, I think it's a negative actually. And it's confusing when you have two brands 
I think uh, Samsung is a good example. I think they missed an opportunity to really give G Galaxy, their smartphone name, a separate identity apart from it. And they, it's simple things, right? They do call it a Galaxy and the ads say Galaxy um, and the box says Galaxy, but what does the back of the phone say? It says Samsung. <laughs> And so, you know, as a result, most people will pick that more well-known name and the name that you put you know, on the phone. They, they call it, most people call it a Samsung phone. Uh, it might be the Galaxy model. So, you know, what you do, you, you, they, you can see they love their name Samsung. <laughs> um, but if they think more, more a multiple brand approach and particularly those new categories, I think they would be even more successful than they currently are. Uh, I understand. Um, I'm thinking a little bit now back to back to what happened, let's say, in recent months. Are there any other things that you feel weren't working that brands were were pushed to solve because of because of what was going on? Um, well, I do think it was um, it was a nice pause for everybody in terms of giving them time to to take a deep look at, at what you're doing, how you're doing it what's working, what's not working. It was a painful pause uh, for most of us and for some companies, really painful if you think about cruise trip, cruise, cruise vacations and Disney World and other things. But, but the good news is, is, is I think having a strong focus and owning something in the mind is the key to the future success. Um, yes, cruises are not popular now. Going to Disney World is, is not popular now. People are fearful of the virus. But guess what? Um, that Disney World owns something so powerful in the mind. And if you are a parent but, uh, of a child between five and 15, it's pretty much mandatory that you have to visit at least once. I don't know what it is, but it's driven into, they've driven it into the DNA that you feel compelled. <laughs> it's kind of the Mecca of childhood uh, to, to go to this magical place. Um, and so, you know, the fact of a short-term issue like this, um, you know, is, is put in relation to understanding the long-term value that your brand still owns. Now, if your brand is, you know, in the mushy middle uh, and not really owning anything, if you're the JC Penney at uh, anchoring a mall, for example, well, unfortunately, you're probably out of business and they have declared bankruptcy and many brands have and are really in trouble because it, it pushed things, accelerated um, their failures. Um, it accelerated our movement to doing a lot more things online and, and, and less going to the mall. Um, there will be some stores people absolutely want to go to and browse. And, you know, people are going, you know, to Target and, and Walmart. And, and there are places that people do enjoy going to and shopping at. And um, so that's not going to end. But those yeah. places that didn't really have a purpose, <laughs> that didn't really have a, a focus for reasons why, and they were just hanging on. Uh, it accelerated um, their decline. Hmm. I was going to ask if you feel that it's any harder or easier to own a position in the mind in times of crisis. Does that does that hinder or help your chances of you know reaching that reaching that goal? Well, it it, it depends on um, it, it gives you hope for the future if you do own something. Um, you know, there's just some things that people are just not doing, not buying places they aren't going. And so your business as a result has deeply declined in many cases. Uh, in a few cases like Peloton and Zoom, obviously they've seen huge upticks. Um, will that you know continue after we go back to our, I don't know, new normal? Um, we'll see, but they have built strong brands and strong cases for using many of these things. And they have to remember to, to really the idea of a brand of what a company needs to do is they need to reinforce the position. Uh, they need to constantly think of how we're going to remind people. And that's where we talk about this idea of, you know, how do PR and advertising play a role in the branding process? Well, we talked about the importance of, of PR, of, of that's the word of mouth uh, driven by, you know, interviews and the, the internet and, and media of putting the idea in the mind. You're creating news value about, and usually your new category, and you drive it in with this excitement of news, right? New something. Um, but over time, that wanes. Um, at, at that point, you do need advertising to reinforce your position. 
So thinking about ways that you can find and events like you were talked about that Monster does to reinforce their position with energy and youth and excitement. Um, what can you do to reinforce that? And thinking about that and instead of, in some cases, people thinking about just what else can we get into? What about, what about internally when you talk to clients and you talk about focus and positioning and in the mind and what about for their folks that are inside the, inside the company? Is it a similar framework or, um, or, or do they, do they differ drastically? Sure. I think it does come from, from the top and, you know, we're in, in most cases working, um, you know, with, with the CEO and, and top, top leaders of, of a company. And so, you know, it comes from them, how others are going to perceive. And so if they are dedicated to focus, um, then that will be uh, felt by others and others will respond in kind. So that, that is incredibly important. And I think we give them the, the support and the rationale for why focus is a good idea and convince them to, to not, you know, get into other things. Many times, you know, leaders, you're always getting ideas from people and you've got to make decisions on what to do and what not to do. And so I mean, that's in, incredibly important, making those decisions of not to line extend, <laughs> not yeah. to unfocus your brand when maybe a new brand is, um, um, a call for, or maybe sticking to, you know, increasing your market share within a given category um, and before you start expanding. Um, it, what's really interesting, and, and you see, um, you know, why didn't they do this before, but a lot of the fast food where, you know, drive through was important, but now they're really investing of like, how can we make drive through even better? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now, you know, with the doubles and, and rethinking the ordering process, why? Because they weren't distracted by the in-store people because <laughs> all yeah. those in-store, you know, parts of the business have been shut down. And, and look, the focus on drive through has made drive through unbelievable when it was really bad before. And see, when you focus, um, good things happen, we say. Uh, because now you've got all your time, all your people, all your resources making one thing better and you can make it really better. And when you're trying to do 10 things at once, listen, you can't do them all well. Yeah, you know, as, as big and as much com uh, money as many of these companies have, you just can't. Um, and so this this forced focus, I think, is, is helped and, and really brought in a, many good things um, about in terms of how companies are approaching their business. Hmm. So then can we safely say that the that the that the transformation that people have been talking about for years now has has finally been achieved for <laughs> quite a large number of companies given what we've seen this year. <laughs> I think people would like to say that, but <laughs> yeah, we have we have we have certainly I think jumped ahead in, in many aspects and and taken a hard look at, at lots of things in our in our lives and our businesses and everything else. Um, and now I think, you know, we're all just anxious to, to get on with it, <laughs> to get on to, to 2021 and to see, you know, it all play out. It's kind of like when you're all prepared and I think we all feel like we're, we're prepared. We have, you know, rededicated, refocused, looked at, cleaned everything yeah. up and, and we're ready to go. And uh, the, you know, the virus is not exactly letting that happen quite yet. Um, and so, you know, that, that is, that is frustrating. Um, because, you know, you have, you know, you have companies like Uber, right, that was just doing unbelievable. Um, and, you know, that that kind of dropped off because people are not comfortable doing that anymore. What's interesting is while it was, I think, unfocused, um, you know, a year ago for their, their Eats business, promoting two things at once, mm -hmm. right, the Uber Eats and the, you know, the passenger business was was confusing and, and, and two at things at the same time. Yeah what's allowed them now to take that Uber Eats business and accelerate it was that they haven't focused, they've had to let go mm -hmm. of the passenger business yeah, good for point. all intents and purposes. And <laughs> it allowed them to actually take their time to focus on the Uber Eats. And of course, you know, we're driven by the excitement and, and wanting to do this like never before. And so it's been able to really help them build, build that brand more and establish that category more in the mind. Hmm. Hey, you bring up a, you bring up a, a, a good point because I'm sitting there thinking if we if we talk about brands very often the way we talk about people then can we say that a forced focus like what happened this year is less you know less effective less sustainable than one that kind of comes naturally just wondering if if this forced focus that happened this year did any brands a a disservice because I'm thinking about you know the human 
is is not necessarily the kind that sticks with it if you <laughs> if you force him or her to do something. So I'm wondering if it's similar for brands and how many of them will will actually stick to it afterwards. I think I think you know sometimes you you need a you know a, a good good nudge. reminder to do something. I think a good push. A good push. I, you know, I don't think that is a bad thing for people or for companies. And so it, it gave them, you know, in some cases, the rationale to sell these things within the company itself mm -hmm. to say, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, for IHOP was you know, thinking, well, let's, you know, launch a new brand of this or get into hamburgers there. And no, we have to, you know, we have to make sure our core business doesn't go away. Yeah. Um, and a little bit of fear about that and, and not, you know, thinking too much of yourself <laughs> and thinking, you know, let's make sure that that core, we make sure we don't lose our you know, yeah. what we're gaining 80% of our revenues from, um, you know, you, you can take it for granted. Um, you know, companies, you know, you take it for granted that, that, that core customer, that core business, that core rationale will just maintain itself on its own. It won't, mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to nurture it. You have to maintain it. And so that, that what has happened this year is I think many companies were forced into making sure that that was maintained properly. Um, and, and getting rid of some distractions, which I think is helpful. So there's nothing wrong with it, you know, being a bit forced upon you. Um, it helps you out to sell it internally for sure. Um, and it's just, it's harder to do when everyone else is expanding. Um, short term, it looks like a good idea. What you don't realize, it, it's long term that that becomes a killer. Um, you know, short term, the first, you know, year of Bud Light, sure, that was great. Um, but over time that, you know, undermines um, the brand and the power of, of, of Budweiser itself. It takes time for some of these, these actions, these unfocusing actions to really, you know, build up and, and really damage you and damage the company as well. Hmm. So if, if we can, for, for the last, for the last 10 minutes, um, I'd like to, I'd like to shift a little bit to, to you and what you guys have been doing, just because I'm wondering, you know, as 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 a branding company and and a very strong one at that what did you, what did you focus on business wise were there things that you cut were there things were there adjustments i'm sure there were but what kinds of adjustments were there made by you guys sure well you know i think we have tried to implement this idea of focus to our own business it's interesting that al back in the day you know he ran an advertising agency for 35 years and it was at this agency that they developed the idea of positioning mm -hmm. and that positioning idea. And then later the book in 1981 really took off and people were very excited about it and wanted their advice. They didn't necessarily want to use, they were a small agency. They didn't necessarily want to use them as their advertising agency. So, you know, it would happen a, like we're talking. I mean, they got slightly unfocused by what? By pleasing the customer. The customer wanted consulting. We'll give them consulting. Mm. The, you know, we already have our agency business. We're not going to let go of that, right? So we're doing a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, but that was an unfocusing event. And it just so happened actually at a speech that Al was giving, talking about this idea of positioning and focus and brands owning something. Uh, a question came up that said, Al, you're not doing what you're preaching here. You're not doing what you're saying. You're selling consulting and advertising agency services. And he said, you're right. <laughs> um, and they actually, they shut down the agency. So it was 50% of their business and they took two years and, you know, give people time and give the clients time. And so mm. they took two years and they shut it down and they con converted everything to consulting, which again, was only 50% of their business, but then was able to grow that business. I, of course, then joined the company. And, and for the past 25 years, we've grown just in the consulting space and even more narrowly just in this um, in one day strategy sessions working with companies. Although we do slight, something slightly different. We have a, a major office than the past 10 years or so we've opened in China mm -hmm. that has a more full Full service. But so, you know, we have tried to implement that idea of, of focus. But so what's happened more recently is we always felt um, that the interaction between us and the client, the talking out these ideas was incredibly important. 
But of course, this year that can't be done. And so we have used technology like most companies uh, so yeah. that we can work from home. And Al's in, you know, one part of Atlanta remote and I'm here on, you know, the, the cameras and the microphones. And so we meet with clients remotely, um, but we do the, do the same thing. We do it a little bit different. It's a little bit shorter and the, what we send the reports and the ideas and the strategy is the same, but the implementation of, of how it works. But it is interesting to, to see how, and even myself, it is always hard to apply your principles to yourself. <laughs> it's easy to this give advice. True. So I always like to share that, you know, it, it, it's where we are not perfect and it, it happens to everybody and there's nothing, um, but, but being able to see it, um, to recognize it, and then to make those changes is what's really going to lead to your long-term success. Understanding the power of, of focus, uh, the power of the name, of owning something, of dominating categories, of finding new categories. These things are critical to, to the long-term success. Hmm. No, you make, you make a really good point. And it's nice. And it's nice to hear similar to how Rob was discussing yesterday. You know, Rob was saying, well, we tried this thing and it, to be honest, it didn't work, you know? Yeah. We're IBM, but it just didn't, it just didn't pan out and here's why. Uh, and so it's nice, it's nice to have, you know, you guys come on here and, and be honest about, about what happens and how it goes and, and things like that. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering since we're coming, uh, since we're coming to the end here, I'm wondering you know, now that we're more connected than, than ever, I think, which many people probably thought wasn't even possible to be more connected than we were before, but here we are. Um, what does, what does global branding look like? I mean, if you're, if you're thinking about your clients and, and, and how they're preparing for 2021, what are, what are some of the, what are some of the trends that you might be able to give us some insight on? Well, th there's no doubt um, the the theme of really the 21st century is going to be the rise of global brands. That the fact of you know just being successful in one country, uh, which primarily you know was the last century, and while you mm -hmm. had a handful of of dominant global brands, I think you have today the opportunity for anybody from any country to build a dominant worldwide global brand. You know, the, the, the next I, I, Ikea or Uber or Red Bull can come from any country in any place and any entrepreneur um, with a good idea and, and the right strategy and, and all of these things working together. But what they do need to understand is what maybe worked and, and the key to global brands and the, the key that people often miss is the idea of focus has to be even tighter. <laughs> mm. That, you know, you might be successful in Sweden <laughs> with, with a brand of, for example, Nokia, which was into everything. The smaller the country, as a matter of fact, the less focused the companies tend to be. It's a smaller country. It's like being in a small town. Yeah. You have a general store that sells everything. That's not going to work in, in New York City. You have thousands of specialty stores. Well, take that, you know, same analogy to the world. Well, if you're in a small country, you, you've got stories, companies that sell everything. When you go onto the world stage, you better be way, way more focused. And so, you know, for Nokia, initially they picked one thing, they picked cell phones, uh, the, the old dumb phones, right? And they dominated the world in cell phones. Um, well, you know, at their home country, they were into a lot of things. So, you know, when you want to build a global brand, you know, traditionally you do start with your home country, you build something. Um, but when you think to go global, you might think of, I might even need to narrow it more <laughs> um, and thinking about the competition of, of how you're going to do that and the ways in which you're going to brand yourselves. And of course, when you do talk about global, the idea of visual becomes even more important because the issue on a global brand is the global language. Yeah. Um, basically, you know, English has become the second language of the world. It tends to be the, if not your first language, the second language you learn and the language of business that people tend to communicate when they have a big meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so working in English tends to be important. Doesn't have to be an English word, doesn't have to be, have a meaning in English, but having it sound and spell easily for someone who knows English um, is incredibly important. So that that is helpful, but also a visual that doesn't need translation. And so you see the rise of, we talked about KFC, 
Um, that name might be complicated, but it is in China, the largest fast food chain in China. And it's that visual that needs no translation. You see Colonel Sanders and, and you know what the brand is. Uh, you're hit with that authenticity um, and memorability and visibility in retail. So having those visuals um, in a global brand is really key. Yeah, that was always the idea. No, the idea was that you have to sit there and think about Starbucks. And if you saw a Starbucks cup and the logo was there, but the name was missing, would you still know that that's what it was? Of course, because of exactly what you're saying. So I think it's, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's super interesting what you say about focus. I think that we, I'd like to think that maybe we indirectly, <laughs> indirectly started doing that just because we, we really took the time this year to think differently about how we want to approach Rebels and Rulers and content and open branding and things like this. And we've always been very focused on that. It's true. But like you said, starting in a starting in a not so small country, but still smaller than some. Um, and this year we've really, you know, it really does work. So I think indirectly I've seen it. I've seen it work. I've seen it change us. I've seen it. I've seen it cause us to to let go of some of the things that maybe uh, people were avid supporters of before saying that we needed to do this, we needed to be this, otherwise we can't compete with this and we can't compete with that. And sometimes I almost feel like it's better to take, you know, like a horse approach and just sit down and have, <laughs> have your eyes covered and not necessarily look at everything that everybody else is doing and just think really about what it is that you want to do. What is that, that, that focus that you find strength in? So, so for me, it's a, uh, it's great to hear you talking about it. it makes makes me feel like we're de definitely on the right path. <laughs> Absolutely, and and that's a, it's a good point. It, it is it, it is important to you can't compete with ev with everyone on everything, um, and the the key is really about being different. Um, all too often, you know, you sit in those meetings. How are we going to be better than this competitor or that competitor? Uh, and, and while you might be better, um, that's a hard thing to communicate. And people yeah. just don't believe, people say, well, everyone says they're better. Nobody believes, it's not a believable statement. Yeah. Um, when you say you're different and you give them the reason why, that starts a conversation. That starts a conversation that people are willing to listen to and willing to give you the chance um, to tell, to, to get that story across and to have some believability along with it. So, you know, thinking about how can I be different? How can I have a focus uh, that not only uh, is a good focus, but is also a differentiation within um, my category or allows me to start a new category. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I think it's great. And, and, and I thank you. I thank you for, for joining us yet again and giving us your time and your, and your thoughts and for making our second session. I'm truly, I'm truly humbled. And thanks to everyone for joining. Really. I've uh, the, the feedback has been great. And I'm, like I said, I, I thank you. I thank everybody that joined. I thank my team. And and I guess what I'm going to say is definitely follow Laura. She's super active on social media, and you'll you'll always know what she thinks about about things, which is something that I I think is I think is admirable. So uh, yeah, and then also of course stay tuned for our next sessions. Our videos are there every day. A new masterclass, and then we have a live Q and A with one of the speakers coming up uh, tomorrow. We have Matt Beispiel. So definitely definitely join us. And thank you again, Laura, really. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. It is my pleasure. I have uh, really enjoyed connecting with you the past couple of years. So proud of all you've accomplished. And uh, I think, you know, well, I believe me, I can't wait to get back to Romania, hopefully do one of these events again, but, you know, having this ability to, to connect and, and make sure we stay connected over this crazy year that it's been, um, is been a wonderful experience too. So we're all trying to get engaged and just, you know, keeping our fingers crossed that 2021, we're all going to get back to it and, uh, have a great time. Wouldn't that be great? We need to do a rebels and rulers reunion. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. The reunion tour. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Thanks again, Laura. And thanks everyone. I think we're going to sign off now, but I I'm sure we're going to talk soon and I'm sure I'm going to see everyone here again hopefully tomorrow. So yeah, have a good one. Bye. bye.